guys. Welcome back to Plastic Paddy's podcast. Cade me the vulture to you all. Episode number 15. And this week we are still on the topic of Irish morphology. I keep thinking to myself, right, this is going to be the last one. This is going to be the last one. But there's just so many good stories. And I haven't even gotten to like gods and goddesses or like any of the creatures of like the Aishi or like, you know, just, yeah, there's so much to cover and I really enjoy it. So I hope you guys like it as well. Um, but this week I'm going to tell you another tale. I really like doing these little like storytelling times. It's really fun. Um, I'm going to tell you the tale of the children of Lear. Um, a lot of you might have heard of this because it's a, like one of the more well-known um, Irish myths. Um, but I really like it. Again, it's a bit sad, but it's a good story. So I'm going to tell you that. But anyway, before we get into that, it's time for Irish Word of the Week. Still no jingle, sadly. I've just messaged my brother now being like, did you send me the jingle? Um, so yeah, sorry about that, guys. Anyway, this week's Irish Word of the Week is... Okay, I learned how to pronounce it and I've completely forgotten, but I think I know what it is. I think it's Lenny and it means children. It's Lenny and I'll put it up on screen and I'll also spell it for you guys on Spotify. It's L E A N A I with a fodder. Lenny, which means children. Beautiful word, as always. Um, so I'm going to catch up on my week. What have I been up to? I've actually had an unreal week. I went to see Hosier and he was, yeah, everything you would imagine a Hosier concert to be, it was and more. It was unreal. So it was in Manchester um, at this amazing venue called the Castlefield Bowl. Anybody who hasn't been, if you ever get a chance to go to a gig at the Castlefield Bowl, you should go. It's such a good venue. Um, it was, oh, he was just unreal obviously his music is already amazing he sounded just as good live you, you ever like been to a concert of one of your favorite artists and they and then you're like they just don't sound as good he sounded amazing his support was the Teskey brothers oh my goodness they were also unreal so 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 talented every single one of them it was amazing. I went with my cousin, who is also one of my best friends. I'm very lucky in that way. I've got cousins that are like very close in age and, to me, and I don't see them that often, but we're just so close. Like anytime I see them, it's like no time at all has passed. They are really like they really are like some of my best friends. So she was with me, and it was just like the perfect night. Everything that you'd want from a gig. So we left quite early. Um, we had a couple of drinks beforehand, and just everybody that we met throughout the the night like just random people were so nice the people that we met at the gig were amazing <coughs> just the vibes the atmosphere like it, it was just unreal and then we went out afterwards for drinks and that was also great we met some really really nice and fun people so it was literally like a perfect night for a gig and then being in Manchester obviously um all my family are from up north so it was an excuse for me to go and see them as well and I stayed with my little nan my my mum's family don't live that far away from Manchester it's very easy to get to it's a small town in Lancashire and I stayed with my little nana and just you know spent some time with her she's 83 now but she's you know there's life in the old bird yet she's doing fantastic so I stayed with her and that was about it just chilled like just relaxed I, I always love when I can just getting out of the city and just being in a bit of like quieter environment and I kind of grew up there so I grew up in London and then moved there for five years and then moved back to London but I moved there at a time that was really pivotal in my like teenage years and I made a lot of bonds and memories there so it's always nice to go back and just be like oh you know it's a bit familiar and nostalgic so that was lovely what else did I do with my week this week <clears throat> Oh, I didn't get the job. Remember I said last week I was waiting on a job um, interview. I didn't get it. But plenty more fish in the sea. You know, if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. And I'm, there's like, I've got loads of interviews and stuff lined up. So keep your fingers crossed for me, gang. I hope, you know, something comes through. Otherwise, I'm going <laughs> to be on the doll. <laughs> I'm going to be signing on. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen with that. We'll see. If anybody, if anybody is looking for, you know, office manager, workplace experience manager, hit me up. I'm your girl. <laughs> um, 
And what else did I do? Oh, I also went to see my mum. My little mum did a 10K run in London. Um, she's in her 60s and she wanted to see if she, she sort of wanted to challenge herself and see if she could still do it. And she did it. She smashed it. Um, so me, my brother, my brother's partner, my boyfriend and my stepdad, my brother's dad, um, all went down to watch her. It was like in the middle of London, like all near Big Ben and stuff. It was great. It was really, really good. And yeah, she smashed it, killed her time. And that was it. That was my week. It was really lovely, very wholesome, like family orientated week. And you guys know that is my vibe. Um, I'm also just one last time. I'm going to stop doing this, but I feel like I should start playing a little game, guessing game of the week, like how busted is Caitlin going to look coming out the podcast this week? I've got that after for anyone not watching. I've got, I'm going to describe my hair to you and all the girl, any girls listening, I bet you will know what this means as soon as I say it. I've got that after school hair. You know, when kids come home and like their mum send them off in the morning with like lovely, neat hair and they get home and their hair is just wild. That's the hair that I've got going on at the moment. But you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm running a podcast, not a bloody fashion show. So give me a break. Thank you very much. Anyway, now we're going to talk about Irish news story of the week. <laughs> So I'm going to, it's pretty much the same story as it was last week because guys, the plot thickens, the plot thickens. So it's flip flop gate, it's RTE, it's Ryan Tubbardy and the whole hurrah. So anybody that's not been watching, last week I mentioned that there was like a bit of funny business going on with money. Basically an advertiser had paid RTE to advertise their product during the break and I think that deal fell through and then RTE ended up subsidizing Ryan Tubbardy with that money that he would have got from the advertisement, but they didn't declare it through taxes. And anybody that doesn't know, um, RTE is like a public station. It's like a government owned um, TV channel that's paid for through gov- tax money and people p- buying their um, TV licenses. It's like the BBC in the UK, RTE. Um, RTE is Ireland's version of that so they have to declare everything everything has to be legit and above board and it wasn't he's like taking like you know payments on the sly thank you very much but he is denying that he knew about this he's saying he got a salary from RTE there was a little bit more of his salary than usual and he was told that it was from an advertisement and that's it. He didn't question it. But then RT, um, I've been watching a little bit clips of like his, I think it's a court case where he's like being questioned about what it was and stuff. And people are saying, no, no, the way that it's set up and the way this works and the way the paperwork all goes through, you would have known what that was and you chose to ignore it basically. So you've allowed, you've pocketed taxpayers' money, Irish taxpayers' money, you've pocketed it. So, yeah, the drama, the drama, Mick, I love it. And it, it's like really divided people. So some people are, after watching him and listening to what he's got to say are kind of like, I, I, I believe that he didn't know, you know, the onus is always on the the employer or the corporation or whatever, which I, I do kind of agree with. Like they should have made it explicitly clear that they were subsidised him and they, and you know, and, and and they should have declared it so yeah I sort of agree with that RT should be held responsible and not the individual but then other people are saying um like he knew basically they're not buying it they're sort of saying he knew exactly what he was doing anybody that was given more money than what they're supposed to wouldn't have declared it they would have just pocketed it um so yeah I don't know what do you think guys tell me what you think in the comments did he know? Did he not know? And then all these other stuff came out as well about like ridiculous things that RTE were buying with taxpayers' money. They spent like two thousand euro, I think just a bit over two thousand euro, on loads of pairs of Haviana flip flops. <laughs> um, yeah, mad things like that. So it's all it's all kicking off. I feel like everywhere at the minute is just. Uh, it being uncut like there's just scandal after scandal after scandal in every country I feel like well the west (laughs) and we know why that is because it's all full of corrupt politicians 
businessmen, etc. Um, but yeah, it feels like everything's falling apart. Well, it is, you know. Anyway, less of that, less of the depressing stuff, less of the world falling apart. And let's get into the juice, the juicy juiciness. So as I said, today I'm going to tell you the tale of the children of Lear. Um, lovely story, not lovely story, sad story. Um, but a really good story. So around the time that uh, the Milesians arrived in Ireland, uh, a new Tuatha Dé king was being chosen. And they chose this guy named Bove Derg. He's been mentioned before in a couple of other um, episodes. For anybody that doesn't know, the Milesians are uh, the last humans to arrive in Ireland and settle. And they're considered like um, the descendants of modern day Irish people, basically. So like my great, you know, ancient ancestors and, you know, people who are on the island of Ireland, they're, they're ancient ancestors, basically. Um, so I said, I wanted to say, I wanted to give like an idea of the timeline. So it's around the time that the Milesians arrived, a new two day Danning king was being chosen. They chose a guy named Bove Derg, like I said. And but there's another guy who was whose name is Lear, and he was one of the front runners, and he was kind of expecting to be chosen, and he is pissed. He is pissed. So Bove and Lear actually end up getting into a feud about this. Um Lear doesn't think that Bove is deserving and it, you know, it becomes pretty serious. It goes on for some time and it causes strife across the whole of Ireland. Basically, people are choosing sides and the nation is kind of split into two. Um, it's kind of looking like it's going to turn into a full-blown war. It, a full-blown war might erupt between the two sides. Eventually, King Bove decides to make peace and he's like, it's not worth going to war over this. Like, I'm the king. You're still, like, Rome, you know, in high circles in society. You're still doing okay. Relax. But he decides as a gesture to, like, as a peace gesture, he offers Lear the hand of his eldest daughter. He offers her, her hand. He offers him her hand in marriage. Lear accepts and the two get married. The woman's name is Eve and they're madly in love. They end up having four beautiful babies so their children's names are Fanula, Aid and a girl called Fanula, a boy called Aid and then two twins boys called I think I'm pronouncing this right Fiacra and Con so not long after giving birth to her final child or children they're twins um, she dies unfortunately Eve dies Lear is of course absolutely heartbroken um, but he's got four kids now, you know, he can't, life can't stop. Unfortunately, you know, life must go on. He's got to carry on for his four kids. So sometime down the line, Lear ends up remarrying. He actually ends up marrying his dead wife's sister and King Bove's second eldest daughter, whose name is Aoife. Um, At first, they're blissfully happy and in love, of course. But as time goes on, isn't it, isn't it always the way? Time reveals all. As time goes on, Aoife becomes bitter, increasingly bitter, actually. Lear absolutely dotes on his children and he feels incredibly guilty. Even though it wasn't his fault, he feels incredibly guilty for the passing of their mother. Um, and he kind of spoils them and he finds himself being both mother and father, like playing both of those roles he doesn't really include Aoife and she ends up feeling on the sidelines, not part of the family at all. He's not, he doesn't mean to, but you know, he's just being protective of his children. Eventually her bitterness starts to grow and, and turns into pure jealousy. It manifests itself into jealousy. She cannot stand how much he loves his children. She feels incredibly, you know, kind of duped. She was like, when we got married, I thought that I was going to be part of a family, but it feels like it's you and your kids over there. And I'm just here as like a bit of a spare part. <clears throat> and she's fuming. And you know, you guys know the saying, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Well, lads, hold on to your hats because this woman is scorned. 
awned, okay? So Eva comes up with a plan to kill the children. Not just his children, but they're her niece and three nephews. She's gonna, she decides she's going to kill them. Uh, all, just so she can have Lear to herself, basically. She obviously can't do it herself, because if he finds out that she's the one to do it, he won't want to be with her and will probably kill her. So she tries to find someone who's willing to do it for her. She offers, she's kind of trying to bribe people. She's offering people riches and land and reward um, for killing the children. But everybody refuses. They're like, no, we're not, they're the kings. They're um, Lear's children. And he's obviously, you know, like I say, well respected and kind of high up in society. So nobody's willing to do it for her. So she, in the end, basically she has to, she has to end up has ends up having to do it herself anyway. So she comes up with this big plan. One day she invites the children out on a ride in her chariot down to the lake. She had planned to kill them and throw their bodies in the water, basically. The children, of course, innocent children, not knowing her plan, are excited to go. So they get into the chariot and they make their way down to the lake. When they arrive, Aoife bottles it, basically. She kind of decides, oh, I, I can't. I don't have it in me to kill four children. So she comes up with another plan. She decides that she's going to place a curse on the children. Remember, the, these people are all two-day Danon. So, you know, she's magical. She's got magic powers. So she decides that she's going to place a curse on the children. She suggests to the kids go and get in the lake and have a swim, have a play about. And once they're in, she casts her spell. And where there were once four cute, you know, little children playing and splashing together, there are now four white swans bobbing along in the water. She's turned them into swans, basically. On realising what's happened, that they're now swans, Fanula the girl of the children challenges Aoife and tells her that her magic isn't as powerful as she thinks it is. And she s declares there and then that the ch one day the children will be freed by the sound of a bell. They're going to hear a bell and that is going to free them from this state. <clears throat> so although Aoife has turned them into swans, she still didn't really have the minerals to do it with confidence and you know full force she feels really 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 guilty so she puts a few kind of like conditions I suppose if that's what you want to call them onto the curse so the first condition is speech she allows them to have their speech so even though they're swans they can still talk and communicate with other humans the second condition is reason which means that they can understand you know other people and they still have the ability to kind of think like a human being. They have the ability to, you know, reason. The third is dignity. So they wouldn't, so she basically made it so that they wouldn't be kind of distressed about the fact that they're now swans. Uh, they can accept the fact and live with it so that their, you know, existence isn't torturous for them. She she gives them that gift basically. Um yeah, so those are the three, I don't really know what to call them, maybe conditions, or the three, like, amendments, I don't know, but yeah, that's what she does. She also sentences them to 900 years in in water, which is absolutely brutal, 900 years, but bear in mind, these children are two a day down, which means they're immortal, but still, 900 years is a long, 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 long time so she sentences them to 300 years in th in three different bodies of water so 300 years in one place 300 years in another 300 years in another so the first so the first 300 years is in um Loch, i think it's called Derivara, which is in county westmeath and then another 300 years in the sea of moyle the Moyle Strait, basically, which is the sort of channel, uh, the North Channel, which separates Scotland and Ireland. She sentenced them to 300 years in there. And then the final 300 years is going to be um, on Inish Gloria, which is an island off the coast of Mayo. And she sentences them to 300 years in the waters around that island. So the children are now swans. And Aoife believes 
that this is going to be the answer to all of her problems basically her and Leah are now going to be together he's going to, it, it, they're going to be closer than ever he's going to love her so much she's going to get everything that she's always wanted from him basically and they're going to live a you know happy wonderful life with that free from the burden of his children so happy as Larry she goes off and she actually makes her way to her father King Bove's court and she arrives and she's acting very strange and when I imagine her, do you know in films when somebody's just like so, killed someone or done something really evil and they're like really calm and just very like plain faced and just very just kind of eerily calm. That's how I would describe it. Like they've done something really evil, but they're just not bothered. That's how I imagine her when I think of this scenario. Um. So yeah, she goes to her court, she goes to her father's court, sorry, and her dad can tell that just something's off, you know, this is, she's acting really weird, and he says to her, um, darling, where are the children? And she kind of bluntly just looks at him, and he's like, they're with their dad, he doesn't trust me with them, why would they be with me? You know, like that kind of reaction, just very like eerily calm and just strange, she's just acting very strange, and obviously both um he knows his daughter he knows and he's like something is off and he's really worried so he ends up sending word to Leah that he thinks Aoife might have actually done something with the children uh Leah obviously knew that Aoife had taken the kids to the lake <clears throat> so he he panicked and straight away rushed down to the lake he gets there he can't see the children, he can't see Aoife, you know, <clears throat> there's no sign of them kind of being around. And then he hears this singing and immediately he recognises the beautiful song and he knows that it's his children singing that song. He recognises their voices straight away, but he's like looking around like, where, like, where are you? Like calling out to them, where are you basically? You can't see them. Then, um, these four swans approach the bank of the lake singing in his children's voices and he instantly knows what Aoife has done that she's obviously turned his babies you know into swans so he tries to get he's obviously devastated he's absolutely heartbroken and at the same time so angry he's angry with her he's angry angry with himself for sort of bringing this dangerous woman into his children's lives but mostly he's just heartbroken for his children and he kind of was like, let's just get home. We'll figure this out. Let's just all go home. He tries to get them to go home with him, but of course they can't leave the water because the curse is 900 years long and they have to spend the first 300 years on that lake. And then the other, um, you know, the strait and then the island and they physically can't leave that water for 500 years. So they can't get out of the water. So they have to stay and instead of them leaving, instead what happens is for hundreds of years, for generations, the two a day Danon come to the lake and they listen to the children and their beautiful songs. Um, their songs were actually said to be magical and they could heal illnesses or like bring peace to people's sorrows, you know, solve people's problems basically. So 300 years passed and eventually they have to move on to spend the next 300 years in the Straits of Moyle, which is, like I said, the North Channel between Scotland and Ireland. Um, and while their time on the lake was lovely and, you know, they were getting loads of visitors, the water in the Straits of Moyle are really cold and really harsh. And not long after they arrive, there's actually a violent storm that blows in and separates the swans. So they're not even together for the next 300 years. They're all alone and they don't have any visitors. You know, there's no two a day done and come to visit them. Um, so th that's a pretty, that's, you know, 300 miserable years basically. But that passes and then they move to the waters that surround Inish Gloria, like I said, to spend their remaining 300 years. Um and th those 300 years in, spent in the wild Atlantic, you know, were a good 300 years. So finally, 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 their 900 year sentence has passed and they can now physically leave <clears throat> the water they've been bound to for this whole time. They can leave now. So they decide to fly home and find their father, Lear. They arrive in Westmeath and are saddened to find that their home 
is no longer there. 900 years have passed and everybody's gone, you know, everything, it's all overgrown and kind of abandoned, really. There's nobody left there. <clears throat> You know, by this point, the Milesians have long, long, long settled in Ireland and the Tuatha Dé Danann are now living in the other world. That was the agreement that they came to. So, yeah, everybody's gone. So the swans decide, you know what, life in Inish Gloria wasn't that bad, so we'll fly back there. So off they went. Now, remember the bell in the beginning of the story that Fanula said was going to free them? Well, when they get back to Inish Gloria they hear the ringing of a bell and it turns out that this bell belongs to a monk who upon seeing the swans tells them that he'd heard of their tale and he'd come to free them um with this bell you know he wanted to try and turn them back into their human form and obviously they're thinking yes you know this is fanula declared this this is what's we're about to be free but unfortunately the sound of the bell doesn't work and the children don't regain their human form. <clears throat> but the story of these swans with the magical healing powers and the beautiful songs um, has spread now across the country. Obviously, they're famous and everybody kind of knows who they are. And the king of Connacht at the time hears the story and decides, I want these swans. I want to take them home with me and I want to give them as a gift to my wife. So he makes the journey to Inish Gloria and he finds the swans. So he, he, you know, he's never known them as children. It, to him, it's all just a tale. So he's looking at these birds as like possessions, basically like prized possessions that is going to make his wife, you know, the queen very happy. So greedily, he reaches out to grab all four swans and take them back to the queen. But immediately upon touching them, they quickly change back into their human form. but Well, not human, they're two a day down, but they look like humans. So they quickly change back into their um, human form. But instead of, at, by this point, instead of four cute sort of youthful children, what is now standing there in front of the king is three really old men and one really old woman, you know, which is so sad. And soon after, the, the four children passed away sadly never seeing their father again and having lived their whole lives cursed to be animals you know they never got a childhood they never got to marry or fall in love or have children which is really really sad but yeah the end guys I hope you enjoyed it I um I love that story it's one of my favorite myths I'm a sucker for, of a, for, for a sad story. I was saying this the other day to um, a friend of mine. I feel like I have a bit of just a natural sadness in me. I'm kind of drawn to sad things like sad songs, sad films, sad stories. Um, it just kind of like sat, watching those things like satisfies a, a sadness in me. And the person that I was saying this to is Irish. And I was like, I wonder if it is an Irish thing. I feel like Irishness is often associated with like sad stuff. Like a lot of Irish songs and stuff are really sad. I don't mean sad as in like, oh, you're so sad. I mean sad as in like emotional and like, um, yeah, just emotional, you know? I don't know. Anyway, that was just my ponderings of myself. That was the end. That was the story of the Children of Lear. I hope you guys really liked it. Um... Yeah, thank you so much for listening, gang. Please comment, subscribe, follow on IG and TikTok. Listen to this podcast wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, you know, Apple Music, Amazon Music, all that jazz. I'm thinking about setting up a Threads account. I don't know what it's like. Twitter was turning awful. I mean, it was, wasn't great, but it was getting really awful. So I wonder if I should start a Threads I might. We'll see. Anyway, I'll let you know next week. Also, please go and listen to my Plastic Paddies podcast playlist. That is such a mouthful on Spotify. It's linked below. Um, and yeah. Oh, do you know what I completely forgot to say actually before I go? Thank you, thank you, thank you so much to everybody that's followed me um, on social media. I'm now at 140 followers on Instagram, 114 followers on TikTok. 
Um, I don't think I've had any more YouTube subscribers yet, but that's okay. I appreciate every single person that's followed me. Um, oh, and <laughs> I also forgot to say, I'm changing my upload day right now to Thursday. I've just found it kind of slots better into my life at the moment, but that, that might change again. Um, and I did just want to say that, you know, making a podcast takes time and, and money really you need money and you need resources so right now I'm just doing what I have with what I've got but I'm really have such a clear vision for this podcast and where I want to take it so I really hope that you will stick around for the journey you know and stick with me because I eventually will start putting more resources into doing this and it will become a lot more professional and it will become a lot more consistent um so please just stick with me I promise you it's going to get better um and yeah, thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, I love you, I love you, I love you. Take care, and I will see you next week. Shanae, bye.